Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Mojito Cast, the worst podcast on the whole internet. Today, this is episode one, and I am receiving my first guest, because this is episode one, duh. You may know her as Red Bard or as Bootleg Stuff, and uh, I'm gonna let you introduce you yourself. This uh, nifty little trick will allow me not to say anything wrong or, you know, that I shouldn't say. So, uh, introduce yourself, please. All right. Hi. Um, I'm Red Bard. You probably know me better as the uh, admin of Bootleg Stuff. Um, I do illustration, I do YouTube stuff, I do cosplay, social media management, uh, I do a little bit of everything. Great. Yeah, I always forget that you do social media management, but, uh, how's that working out for you? Uh, pretty good. I recently landed a really fancy career type job. Nice. Uh, doing exactly that, but you will never know where. <laughs> Yeah, th this uh, this kind of thing is better st uh, kept secret. But mm. um, yeah, you know, as long as you're doing fine. That's, yeah, that's I mean, great. I have like 3,000 followers on Twitter. I'm way, way too famous. Way too famous. <laughs> people, people will be, you know, making mass exoduses over to my job, you know, just trying to see me. I'm a busy gal. I'm too famous. Yeah, I understand. I understand that perfectly. So, um... What about talking about some recent events uh, to start the show? There's no frontier about what we can uh, talk about here. No censorship. There's only one rule, no politics. Apart from that, nothing is off limits. And uh, just a soft subject that I've heard about recently a lot, surprisingly, even if it has been a problem for a very long time, it's about... Uh, exclusives and on, on consoles and, and PC and a lot of people are sparking the debate again saying that exclusives hurt gamers much more than uh, they help them what's your opinion on this if you have one well it would be really nice obviously if there was like one super console that could run every kind of game and you could make the argument that thanks to emulators the PC is exactly that sure but from an economic standpoint you got to put yourself in sony's shoes in microsoft's shoes you know at the end of the day they are competing and they do need to find ways to make money i do think though that um even if uh like console exclusives even if we can't make that happen what i do think would be a good substitute for that would be um like cross console play like i know some games have already done this but um you know being exclusive to one console or two consoles i think honestly i think two is the magic number for me um offer more play between pc ps4 pc xbox whatever yeah I, I started this train of thought and I really don't know where I'm going with it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I remember when I was uh, when I was uh, a kid, uh, there was a, a lot less exclusives, but uh, there was a different thing is that the same game was really different on, on different consoles. Uh, when I was uh, young and really getting into video games, the two main competitors were uh, the, the Mega Drive from Sega and the Super Nintendo. And uh, a lot of games uh, were released for the, both the consoles at the same time, but they look really different. Some games uh, look better on Sega, some of the games look better on Nintendo. And nowadays we have, uh, we have consoles that are more and more similar to each other uh, in many ways. And uh, it's, it's fun how to, to see how the debate has shifted uh, from uh, which one is uh, best and... Uh, a lot of people are saying, just buy all the consoles if you really like video games. I like the idea of, like, you know, having a game on console and then, like... This this is what I should have said earlier for the perfect uh, medium, is releasing your game on whatever console you want to release it on and then releasing it on PC, like, a year or two later. I think, honestly, I think Final Fantasy XV really nailed it. You know, it came out for PS4, it was on PS4, it was an exclusive for, like, a year and a half. And then it recently came out on PC um, with a slew of new content. Uh, God, that's that's what I should have said earlier. God damn it. 
Ah, actually, uh, th th what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't know if you have the same system in the U.S., but uh, here in France, uh, you when you release a new movie, you have to release it uh, in theaters first, and then you have to wait uh, like nine months to be able to release it on DVD, Blu-ray, Netflix, whatever. And so it would be. It's usually kind... not nine months over here, but yeah, it's the same over here. It's usually it used to be like nine months. Yeah. Um, like back in the uh, early and mid 2000s and before that, obviously, too. But, um, you know, recently I was in Best Buy and mm -hmm. I saw the disaster artist on Blu-ray and DVD just already yeah. chilling uh, yeah. on the shelves. And I saw that movie in like, what, December, January? Yeah, somewhere I don't around there. Exactly, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I think over here it's closer to like that. three to four months. Okay. But yeah, there would be a, a kind of an interesting system. You release first the, the game on your platform of choice, the one you really want to, you know, promote or do business with. And then maybe a year later, you release on uh, other platforms. That's uh, that's an interesting idea, actually. It is, because you make, you know, game devs make most of their sales within, usually within the first, like, couple days, the first week. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. within a year... You know, unless you have plans to make some major addition to the game, yeah, most games make most of their. In fact, I can't think of a. I can't think of a different case. But correct me if I'm wrong. Most games make most of their sales within the first year. Oh yeah, I absolutely. I cannot, at the it's... top of my head, think of a game that made more sales out of its first year. But ne ne neither do I. I it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I. Uh... Absolutely, that's the case. And uh, maybe even in the first month. Honestly, because, uh, with most games, probably. Probably not with... Um, I can think of maybe some AAA titles that might be an exception, like maybe GTA V or Skyrim or something like that, but, but yeah, most and, and games that... that aren't like super big AAA releases, yeah, probably. Sure, and right now, the, the pre-orders are getting more and more popular, so... Uh... Even on the first yeah. day, you see huge numbers. Yeah. What gave you the idea of starting your um, bootleg stuff page? I'd love for bootlegs, I wager, but maybe something more. Uh, yeah, actually. So, um, literally, I was just going through my computer one day, and I yeah. realized, wow, I have a fuck ton of pictures of like stupid bootlegs <laughs> posted. And I looked around, and I couldn't find any pages that were posting them. So I was like, guess I'll do it myself, and I did it myself, and and now I'm here. Did you start uh, collecting bootlegs yourself, or just hoarding pictures? Well, originally it was hoarding pictures, but, you know, I didn't really have access to where I could find a lot of good bootlegs here in the States. Um, because, like, most of the bootlegs, uh, especially ones that I post, most bootlegs in general are found in countries that have like a lot more lax copyright laws. Uh, Brazil, China, Malaysia, the Philippines, you know, stuff like that. There are still bootlegs in America, but they're mostly like, uh, like scraps or like things that people bring from Brazil, the Philippines, China, Malaysia, etc. We don't, um, we don't really have, and even the bootlegs we do have, you know, they're not, quite the same caliber they're like bootlegs that are like actually looking like they're trying to be legit because you know our, uh, our copyright market or copyright laws are way different but i digress um but after a while i did start eventually finding some over here and i have bought a few online as well so i do have a collection but it's a pretty humble collection what's your best piece so far Ooh, i have two favorites actually um oh, please so do tell. one of them is um it's a PSP bootleg, but instead of PSP, it says PCP. I remember uh, it is this one that has really weird game names, and one of them is called Chanticleer Hegemony. Yep, that's there. Oh, that's there. That's... There's uh, there's Street Warrior. Um, yeah. Tell you what, if you want to give me a hot second, I can grab it and I could read them off to you. Sure. All right. Here we go. Yeah, PCP station. Such it is a, a bootleg game. PSP. It's called PCP. It takes AA batteries, and <laughs> it has such gems as Thunderbolt Airplane. Nice. Super Mary. Oh, yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. uh, Street Overlord. Yeah. 
<laughs> non such fly racing. <laughs> and of course, the infamous Chanticleer hegemony. That's that's amazing. I I love how this uh, went probably from through uh, some uh, you know automatic translator software. Or, you know, as I, I love that. And yeah. uh, what's and what's the other one? So you tell me you had two favorites, and this one was yes, the first. Um, what's the next one? The other one. The other one is a really bad like Sailor Moon bootleg toy. Um, oh yeah. The packaging says Sailor Planet, and it just has this really poorly drawn, <laughs> obviously Sailor Moon, but apparently not because the color palette's slightly different. Yeah. Um, and then the toy itself is Sailor Venus, but just with a different color palette. <laughs> um, I found that uh, one here in Oklahoma City. Um, yeah. I found it in a vintage stock. Um, it was just sitting there in the packaging, and it was $3. Oh, yeah. Often, uh, like, thrift store, you know... Uh... Stores like well, Vintage the, the... Stock isn't a it's a thrift store. It's uh it's a retro game store that we have here oh, in the okay. Midwestern United States. It's oh. like in Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri, Kansas. Um, yeah, normally they're a retro game store, uh, and some locations sell like, you know, toys and collectibles. Most of them have yeah. games, anime, movies, and music. Uh -huh, um, and the closest location to me has a pretty fair selection of toys in the back. It's the only bootleg that I have found in Oklahoma City. Okay, so <clears throat> that's something. I I, I, oh, I yeah. understand why you're uh, you're uh, you know uh, what's the word um, attached to it. Mm. Um, yeah, we we have a few. Um, vintage video game stores here but you would never find something for th three bucks in here the prices are insane the 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 video games uh they're from the from the 80s and shit they usually go for uh thousands or at least hundreds so it's uh it's well are they rare of... games to begin with uh i imagine yeah i'm not an expert myself but i i think so yeah Rare I, uh, games, vintage consoles in mint condition with the box and everything. It's, it's always yeah. huge prices. But yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a misconception that goes around like a lot of video game vendors and sellers who don't necessarily know what they're selling that just because a game is old means it's worth a lot. And mm -hmm. uh I'm a I'm a wannabe video game collector. Um so I actually do a lot of looking into pricing and such. There's actually yeah. You know, on most old consoles, most of the games on it, I say most, in fact, it's all that I can think of, but, uh, you know, it's usually a very small percentage of games on the console yeah. that are rare, and it's, in, it's an even smaller number that will hit the triple digits, you know? Some people, you know, I've been to flea markets, and there are people who will bring, like, a fucking Madden game or, you know... <laughs> And shit like that and it'll be like on the ps1 and they'll be like well the ps1 they're currently on the ps4 this is at least two years old so it must be vintage i'm going yeah. to mark this at five thousand dollars people will be lining up out the door for this yeah game. This, this happens everywhere and and usually it's it's funny when you have kind of like a a huge like yard sale with several people uh, participating because you will have a, a huge discrepancy in the prices even if the people are selling the exact same thing i remember i was uh, at some kind of sale like that um, a few months ago and uh, and yeah there were two sellers for vintage cameras and uh, one of them sell, sold the cameras uh, for a uh, hundreds each and the other ones was like yeah this one's five bucks i don't know it's from the 70s and it was like some rare uh model from japan from the, i don't know the minolta or something like that and it was like okay it's uh <laughs> and and the, the 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 two guys were like i don't know of, of uh 30 seconds walking from each other you know and uh, yeah it's the it's a it's a clusterfuck uh, on the on the market of vintage video games, and uh, the the only thing that's I don't really want to say it's sad, but yeah, most people who, who buy them are just for uh, 
putting them on a shelf and never play them and it's it's kind of weird because of course if you want to play vintage video games you can all, all just um, install an emulator and, and play any console any game you want in in seconds but um, I don't know there's something maybe it's the controllers or maybe it's uh, I don't know the the just the kind of feeling but uh, do you think it's irrational to prefer to use the, the the actual console rather than an emulator I mean I think it really depends on the game and the gamer you know some people might prefer playing games on their PC so an emulator would be better but you know obviously I would also like to say you know you shouldn't you know, piracy is bad and you should support the game developer you like, but, you know, there are instances where that might not be an option. Like, um, like up until a couple of years ago, if you wanted to play Earthbound, you know, like, I would have loved to have gone out and purchased an Earthbound cartridge, but yeah. they're, like, two, three hundred dollars you know? So an yeah. emulator is kind of the only option. I can think of a lot of uh, other games that are still the same way. Rule of Rose on the PS2. If you want to play Rule of Rose, unless you have like two or three hundred dollars to shell out, you've got to emulate that sucker. But yeah, yeah but yeah. if you have the money and you you know want to have a copy of this game, you know, do it. Go for it. I just it really depends on the gamer and their preferences. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you I know, I went that's... out and I purchased Dot yeah. Hack Quarantine like two yeah. years ago. I paid $150 for that. <laughs> so, but that's the only game I would ever dream of spending that much money on. Yeah. And if you have some kind of sentimental attachment, it's different, I guess. But uh, I, this... I'm a huge fan of Dot Hack. And um, I, <laughs> I had been like actively wanting that game for so long. Dot Hack games. Um, usually float to the top of uh like rarest ps2 games list dot hack quarantine mm -hmm. is actually considered to be the second uh rarest slash most expensive game on the ps2 second to rule of rose as a matter of fact um so you know for me dot hack it's one of my favorite franchises of all time um and also they are notoriously difficult to emulate uh oh yeah so. that's 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 the thing too yeah and, so uh, for me, getting Dot .hack quarantine, you know, just shelling out the 150, you know. Yeah. For me, it felt right, but, you know, for someone else, you know, that might not be the case, you know. It's $150, you know. Not everybody wants to shell out that much on a game. I don't want to shell out that much on a game. <laughs> yeah, but it was something special. You treated yourself, basically. Exactly. Buying that game with self-care. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but actually, that's... Um... That's an interesting uh, a debate that it makes me think about. It's um, material versus uh, dematerialized. Uh, and it's a debate that I've uh, also heard a lot about recently. Ex uh, for example, uh, a lot of people are saying that you can only enjoy a book if you have the physical copy in your hands with the, the pages and the ink and all that shit. And all, uh, some other people are saying, no, I have a Kindle. Uh, it's the exact same experience and actually it's uh you know it's uh, kind of friendly for the environment because you don't have to cut trees to make the paper and uh, yeah. it's smaller to store so it's practical and uh, and and, and I, I i hear this huge debate all the time some people say yeah i still buy vinyls and cassettes because at least i have a physical copy and other people are telling me you're stupid we have spotify uh, you don't need this anymore. And what's your stance on all that? What's your uh, opinion, w whether it is books, video games, movies, or uh, music? Again, I I really think it kind of depends on the person. You know, some people might find more enjoyment in having the book in their hands. I'm one of those people. I love having the book in my hands. Um, but if you like the Kindle, I mean, go for it. It's whatever whatever works for you. And, you know, the Kindle is really practical. Like you said, it does save on trees um better for the environment all that it just it really depends on the person do whatever works best for you i mean at the end of the day you're still reading the same book you know you're still getting the same thing out of it it's just you know digesting it in whatever way makes you happier i think that's uh really uh nice philosophy it's kind of it, it kind of buddhist sounds sounds to me like 
whatever it's whatever is better for you is fine yeah i mean neither like... neither medium is inherently better than the other yeah, i mean that's true that's a thing that we don't hear uh enough in my opinion it's that neither medium is in inherently better than the other that's a really really true thing and uh thank you for saying it no no problem buddy <laughs> you know it's funny you should bring up the the book topic specifically i worked at a barnes and noble for uh -huh about a year barnes noble is a uh, it's a bookstore franchise we have over here in the united states I heard and about it. i worked in uh, i worked in one of the largest uh, stores in the country mm -hmm. and we had a massive um nook section and nook is like the barnes noble version of kindle okay so that argument that was something i heard like every single day <laughs> was like people in the nook section just looking looking judgingly over at us you know physical book reading peasants and the uh <laughs> you know physical book readers looking at the nook using peasants uh yeah i can imagine <laughs> and i would constantly get asked questions like well is the nook inherently better than the physical book is the book inherently better than the nook uh why should i get nook instead of kindle that's actually probably the one i heard most but <laughs> but yeah that was it was something i heard every single day maybe this will be a new identity uh soon maybe in the future that will be uh the people who prefer uh to download everything on just uh their um ssd and the people who prefer how to have the physical copies this will be the new fighting identities of, of tomorrow just like the just like the rockers vs the mods in the 70s mm, that'd be cool <laughs> you heard it here first you heard it first folks <laughs> mark my words this will happen sooner or later That reminds me of a scene from Parks and Recreation, yeah. where uh, it's an episode where one of the guys uh, has to DJs for a high school prom, uh -huh. and he doesn't know what kind of music is cool, and one of the uh, and one of the high schoolers is looking at him, and he says, "I only listen to CDs. It's the way music like this was meant to be played." Oh, that's uh, <laughs> that's funny. And it's it's uh, I haven't seen Parks and Rec. I, I've tried the first few episodes, but uh, I I just couldn't get into it. But I'll try again another time because a lot of people are telling me lots of good things about it. But it's funny because this actually happened to me, like in real life. Uh, not exactly the same scene, but um, you you weren't you weren't DJing a high school prom. No, not exactly. Especially since proms don't exist here. Oh really? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, they they it's uh it's seen as a typically U.S. thing. I don't think it, they really exist in any other part of the world. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that fraternities to and the weird hats that you put on when you graduate. I don't know what these are for, but yeah, those don't exist at all. But um. Whoa. <laughs> you just had your culture shock. <laughs> Europe is incredible. <laughs> It is. Um Oh, but yeah, 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 it was um it was a few years ago uh with uh with a former uh I'm sorry you hear my... my dog in the background. I'm sorry. No, I I love dogs. It's uh I, I it's no problem for me. Mm. And um, yeah, so it was. Uh, I re I was. I remember it was in two thousand and eleven. In the uh, and uh, here uh, we have a thing called uh, Music Day. That's kind of important here. It was started a, a bunch of time ago, and um, on Music Day, which is in the middle of June, uh, all the musicians go out in the street with their uh, their arms, their whatever, the singing or guitar or keyboards, drums, whatever. And every, everyone makes music or everyone listens to music with their windows open. It's music day. And it's a kind of big thing here. It's quite, kind of one of the biggest day offs we have. Huh. And I remember, I will, yeah. <laughs> and um, it's very, it's very, very French. I don't think it exists in any other part of Europe. Huh, I didn't know that. And um, so I was with, uh, with this girl and we were living together and... Um, for music day we were kind of tired and we didn't really want to go out and we, um, i don't remember if it was i think it was a really hot day and we were all sweating and we didn't didn't really want to go out of outside of the house so uh what we did is that uh, we put on a cd to uh 
to reminisce of how music used to be and you know to uh, because all the time we only used like Spotify and, and YouTube and, and shit like that and but this time for music day we're gonna do things right we're gonna put on a CD <laughs> I don't remember at all what the CD was but the this scene this scene is uh it's still in my mind so yeah it's uh it's a thing it's like uh the traditional way uh, how our ancestors used to be <laughs> it's, it's so funny to, to that technology is evolving so fast right now that uh, a lot of people are uh, you know uh, people from 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 your generation don't know a lot of things from my generation and and uh, it's uh, it's almost becoming like a five year gap where everything changes completely it's kind of funny yeah you know um at my uh, at my first day at my fancy new job uh yeah. this would have been about two weeks ago um uh -huh. so when they were uh, when they were giving me the orientation they were like you can listen to music while you work if you know you don't have like a meeting coming up or mm -hmm. you know if you know that nobody's going to be seeking you out for a bit mm -hmm. as long as you wear headphones but we can't let you stream music because you know we're using up a lot of bandwidth as it is you know you uh -huh. never know if you know, someone down the hall yeah. needs a lot for a Skype meeting or, you know, whatever Absolutely. else. So we try to yeah. limit streaming to uh, mm -hmm. to people who need to use it. So if you want to listen to music, you either have to, like, bring it in on a flash drive with a bunch of downloads. Or if you want to bring a CD and burn it to the computer, you're welcome to do that, too. And I was like... <laughs> and I was just sitting there like slightly flabbergasted and I was like well unfortunately the only CDs I own are from like the mid 2000s <laughs> yeah and half of them are uh, AOL demo disc when you can download 60 free hours of internet mm. I gave yeah, away yeah. one of those on Twitter <laughs> I still have some of these I, I, I'm sure they maybe they're worth something now they aren't I looked into oh. it. Uh, I looked into it, and the one I had was worth like two dollars, hardly. I gave it away on okay. Twitter, and one of my friends actually ended up winning the giveaway. <laughs> so I didn't even have to ship it. I just next time I saw him, I was like, "You're a piece of shit." <laughs> That's funny. Stealing from my followers. <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, um, I live in my grandparents' house, actually, uh, so oh. and my grandpa's a bit of a hoarder, so every now and again we'll find shit like that just around. It's pretty bizarre. Cool. We, uh, we have newspapers downstairs from, like, the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry again about <laughs> the dogs. Fine. There are five dogs in this house. Mm. Nice. Five dogs. My parents live here. My siblings live here, and my grandparents. Oh, so it's a uh, full house. Huh? No, I I said so. It's a uh, it's a full house. Unfortunately. <laughs> is it kind of is it is it kind of like the sitcom or? Uh... No, it is not. It is not fun. It is not cute. Oh shit! Sorry about that. How do you usually relax? Um, honestly, video games usually. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, lately I'm playing a lot of Yakuza Six, and that's mm -hmm. been that's been really cool. Yeah, that's been really cool. I tried saying good and cool at the same time. Uh, you <laughs> yeah, know, that's funny. I... So <clears throat> yeah. So video games, anime, because I'm a weeaboo, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Sadly, no, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Um, but. You know that's funny because uh, um, I think that video games are are great to uh, wind down. A lot of a lot of people think that video games make you stressed and everything, but I think it's one of the best ways to relax. And uh, I've tried a lot of different uh, type of games to uh, try to unwind uh, uh, the best, and I have found out that racing games is what work best for me. Whatever racing game it is, where whether it's like a rally game or Mario Kart or F Zero or whatever, it's that's what relaxes me the best. Mm. Sometimes I sometimes I even play them to to fall asleep at night because I have issues to um to sleep. Oh wow! And and uh, they work really well, especially F Zero. That's the best one. You know, I've never played F Zero. Oh, okay. 
Do you do you don't play racing games at all or? Uh, oh no, I fucking love Mario Kart. I mean, <laughs> for a long it's... time, Double Dash was the only game I had on the GameCube. Um, I actually okay. quite like racing games. It's just that you know I didn't get a GameCube until like the GameCube was like mm -hmm. inching its way out of the console market. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a long time, the only game I had was Double Dash. And then I had a Naruto game. And what else did I have? I didn't know that. I think I had like Naruto some... Games, I'm not surprised. I had like yeah. some bullshit shovelware Mike Myers Cat in the Hat game. Yeah, we all had some of those. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. The other games on GameCube I played, I would just borrow from friends. And I guess none of my friends bought a zero. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my favorite one is the one on Game Boy Advance. And uh, it's uh, the one that I played the most because I can, because of the Game Boy Advance, I can play in bed. Uh, mm -hmm. so it was great to, uh, you know, fall asleep. Uh, what's what's the worst video game you've ever played? The worst video game I've ever played? Yeah. So do you mean that in, like, a way that it's genuinely bad or, like, so bad it's good? Mm, please say both. Okay. Uh, so for genuinely bad... Mm, <sighs> Final Fantasy X-2 definitely comes to mind. Oh. Um, but I'm trying to think, because at least from a technical standpoint, it's still sound. I'm trying to think, is there anything, yeah. like, totally busted, and not in a way that made it funny that I've ever played? I mean, Bioshock 2 was pretty bullshit. Seriously? Oh. Oh. That's one of my favorite games of all time. I'm very surprised. Yeah. But, okay. No, I, uh, I used to have a roommate who, who felt the same way. She adored Bioshock 2. Um... So I understand. I understand the argument for why some people like it. I just thought it was bullshit. Um, huh. Okay. Let's see. What else? What else springs to my? Oh, um, fucking Final Fantasy VII: Dirge of Cerberus. Actually, that's a pretty strong contender. What is that? I never heard about it. Oh my fucking god! You know, there's a reason you never heard about it. So Final Fantasy VII, we have this amazing game, revolutionized yeah. the JRPG genre and really brought it brought it to the uh, to the forefront of gaming. It really, you know, many people say that's what put JRPGs on the gaming map in pretty much everywhere but Japan. Um, Absolutely. I don't yeah. even like JRPGs, but I like Final Fantasy VII. Exactly, because it's a great ass game, and uh, yeah. And, you know, it sold like hotcakes everywhere it went. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Square Enix noticing that, wow, we have, you know, one hell of a cash cow here. You know, let's milk it for all we can. Uh, they made a series of spinoffs. They made the Advent Children movie. They made um, another anime OVA that I forget the name of. And they made two games. They made a prequel called Crisis Core that came out on the PSP. Oh, I heard about this one. Um, huh? I heard about this one. Yeah, and it received a, uh, it received Mixed. generally lukewarm reception. Yeah. You know, people were like, you know, the game itself is sound and it plays fine, but it uh, kind of pointlessly retcons pieces of the Final Fantasy VII story. So a lot of no, people no. like to just choose to ignore it. Um, yeah. And then there is the lesser known spinoff game called Dirge of Cerberus. Um, it's a spin-off game about our favorite hot topic edgelord, uh, Vincent Valentine. <laughs> and I don't even fucking remember what the game is about, all right? Let me tell you what I remember about Dirge of Cerberus. I remember being, like, 11, 12 years old. I remember seeing the Final Fantasy VII logo and saying, wow, okay, this must be good. Um, so I bought it. And it was bullshit. And you're like, the the place, the first level is like on fire. The game is like super fucking difficult for no reason. The gameplay is busted as hell. The story makes no sense. I tried picking it up again years later to see if it had aged any better. It hadn't. It was still bullshit. <laughs> um, as much as I hate like Final Fantasy X-2, you know, okay. <laughs> a lot of the reason I hate ten two is just because it's a horrible sequel to a wonderful game, so I'm kind of bitter yeah. about that. But from a technical standpoint, Dirge of Cerberus is worse on any any day of the week. I'll look into it. You made me 
curious to see how bad it was. It's pretty bad. Uh, and not <laughs> and not even in a cute, it's so bad, it's good way. It's just fucking bad. However, yeah. on the topic of so bad, it's good, I already know exactly what my contender for this game is. Uh, oh. Tell me, have you ever heard of a little video game franchise called Spyro? Ring a bell? Uh, sure. Ring a bell? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the original Spyro trilogy is fucking awesome. It is, you know, yeah. some of the best... 3D platformers to have ever graced this earth. And then the PS2 happened, and uh, do you remember a game called Spyro Enter the Dragonfly? No. Yeah, nobody talks about it. You want to know why nobody talks about it? Yeah, please, do tell. Because the game is a glitchy fucking mess. At the very least, it is on the PS2. I've been told that the GameCube version is not nearly as bad, but the PS2 version is so glitchy it is so glitchy that you can actually like um there's a portal to where the final boss is and if you like head charge at it for long enough you'll just bust through and you'll just be fighting the final boss just right there in the beginning of the game yeah and that's not even (laughs) and that barely even cuts the top five most glitchiest things in this game like there are characters (laughs) who's like uh you know their eyes will follow you you know as you walk around and there are people who's like because of that their heads will twist in like 360 degrees (laughs) um you know uh Hmm. if you charge it you know it's not just the final boss if you charge at any gate or portal for long enough most of them will just let you through for no goddamn wow. reason on the earth, uh, there's a lot of clipping that can make gameplay really hard. The controls are loose and sloppy. Uh, mm. I have a really weird attachment to this game, and I'll tell you why. It is because it was one of the first console video games I ever owned. Uh, so when I started seeing all these glitches, you know, I'm like eight, nine years old at this point, you know, Uh up until now, most of the other games I played were like on the PC. They were like point and click adventures and shit like that. Uh So, um, and the very few console games I did play were like, they were actually racing games. So, uh, it was racing games in like Jack and Daxter. So, (laughs) uh, so for a while I thought, well, you know, maybe how console games are i mean you know most of the racing games i played you know were you know pretty glitchy and they did have a lot of clipping graphics so i thought that was just i thought that was just how video games were but as i got older and i revisited that game i was like oh no this one is just a train wreck and um <laughs> and it's really funny because again you can just be at the final boss within within five minutes and the reason it's like this is because um this is like yeah. this game is like the summary of why you should not give game devs like too little time to do too much because uh when they were oh, first yeah. planning this game out it was actually designed to be really ambitious there were going to be like i want to say like 20 something unique levels and they were like super fleshed out and they sounded super cool and then they were like by the way we need this thing out by christmas so oh, it yeah. got so exa- exactly the same yeah exactly the same story as for uh, Sonic 06 basically yeah so suddenly there's like what i want to say like barely 10 levels in the game now it's glitchy yeah. as hell the gameplay is loose and hell but you know after you play it for like 10 minutes you know yeah. you, you can't help at least i can't help but just be charmed and entranced by just how glitchy they allowed (laughs) this game to be you know there were a lot of executive decisions made to be like you know what (laughs) fuck this fuck christmas fuck spyro (laughs) you know who the fuck cares and then they just published the game anyway and you know this was a little before you could just patch a game up and sure yep. enough, you know, Spyro Enter the Dragonfly never got revisited. And on that Spyro HD collection that's coming out, it is nowhere to be seen on there. <laughs> uh, which is kind of disappointing because honestly, I feel like it could be a legitimately good game. Yeah, uh, it's it's often like that with game like with games uh, like that. It's often you you think maybe if the devs had had just more time or more budget or more yeah growth, it could yeah, have been a great game. Yeah, if they had game. more time, honestly, they could have made this game great. You know, it probably could have been 
you know, probably not considered, you know, as great as the original three Spyro games, but, you know, it would probably be considered a worthy sequel. Uh, but yeah. now I've never, you know, the few people I've encountered that do remember this game and have played it, uh, they all fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, it's good for a laugh, you know, but, yeah. but that's about it. You know, it's not a legitimately good game and it's, you know, this is where Spyro started going downhill. <laughs> Because after this, this the, uh, the Game Boy Advance games came out, and and then eventually yeah. Skylanders. Oh. The Game Boy Advance games were not that bad, uh, but uh, yeah, they were not that good. I had, I had Season of Ice, and I remember thinking it was like really okay. Yeah, like I was solid like, 6 out of 10. Maybe. Yeah, I was like, this could have been great if this were like on the PS2. You know, this would be better mm -hmm. if it were... 3D, but, you know, it's okay. Yeah. Those are the worst video games I have ever played. Um, sh shout out to any Silent Hill past 3. Actually, no, any Silent <laughs> Hill past 4. That's not okay. PT. <laughs> um, PT looks great, I really want to try it. Is, it. is that the game that is literally just a corridor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I really want to try this one. Good luck finding it. <laughs> yeah, Good I heard luck. that, but, uh... Um, I'll, I'll try my best. No, oh, you should. Honestly, PT is one of the best horror games I've played. Like, oh, I shouldn't say horror games, but recent horror games that uh -huh. I've played in so fucking long. And it was so short and so simple. It was, it was elegant. Sounds sounds nice. Oh, it um, was. You missed out. I'll try to find it. I'll try my best. I'm sure, I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Like, people have not just abandoned PT. I like, hope so. I'm sure if you look hard enough, you'll find it. Uh, what was my next question? Oh, yeah. Uh, here's the good one. Uh, where does your uh, Red Bard name come from? Oh, what God. What does it mean? So, let me tell you. So, my original online handle... I yeah. just, I, I didn't like it very much. I made it when I was like 13 mm -hmm. and I had been using it, you know, by this time I was like 20, uh, 20, yeah. 21. So I was thinking to myself like, okay, I'm over this. And I was, uh, that was around the time I was really getting into D and D and I really like playing bards. Um, and also in like the actual meaning of bard, like the actual role of bard in history is really fucking cool because they were not just minstrels they were also like bookkeepers like they um i shouldn't say bookkeepers necessarily but like history preservers they were very much in charge of like you know having to learn the history of an event an area a person whatever and passing down that knowledge often because you know this was uh you know this is the middle ages you know books were not very easy to come by, and most of the books you did find were like the Bible. So bards were often tasked with preserving the history of certain things. And you know, I'm a huge history buff, so I, I, you know, I've always thought that was really fucking cool. And then the red part, um, you know, the thing about being ginger is that that's just inherently your nickname. Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, uh, a little bit. So. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So I was like, okay, I'll just do Red Bard, but just plain Red Bard is taken on most websites. So I added the is cool part because I'm cool. <laughs> At least that's what I like to pretend. But, <laughs> but you know, are. I think, I think, you know, being a history nerd who watches Star Trek for 50 hours and still lives in her grandparents' house, I, yeah, I think that makes me very cool. Yeah, that's very cool in a really George Costanza way. It's um it I, I'm sure it will be cool one day. It 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 has to be there are so many fashions and so many trends that have emerged in the past years that I'm sure that someday watching Star Trek and living with your grandparents will become the coolest thing. It it will be vogue. I, I'm a transitor, y'all. I'm a li yeah. I'm a lifestyle guru. I'm here I believe. I'm here out in the field. You know, I'm play testing this for you. I think it's going great. I'm exactly. taking the last of the notes down. You know, I'm just making sure that it's uh, safe and healthy for everybody Science. else. I'm doing y'all a favor. Honest to God, I am. Absolutely. Where did Mojito come from? Because originally you were exploding fish. 
And now you're Mojito. Uh, it's um, actually, I, I did a really long video about it where I explained everything. And as soon as I published the video, I forgot everything about it. So I would have to watch it again. But this uh, it's the thing that I really thought out for um, many weeks and I uh, thought it was perfect. And uh, then I published the, the new name with the explanation and I completely forgot about it. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll watch the video sometime. I've been, <laughs> if you, I've if been you want, too I'm busy not, with my job uh, to watch video. I'm, I'm not sure it's worth it. Well, it's funny because your name comes from when you were 13 years old and you remember perfectly and mine is from like two months ago and I already totally forgot. Dude, I remember, but, yeah. I remember most of my usernames. I remember the first wow. username I ever made and that was Eok. Um, oh, your mic cut for a few seconds there. You say oh. what? Sorry, I said I remember even my first username I ever made, and that was for Neopets, and that was also like the mm. only website I used that one for. It was Amy Rose one two one one zero because I was getting into. I had like just discovered Sonic the Hedgehog at the time because nice. I was like yeah. ten, yeah. and and I was like, okay, I guess I'll I'll do the girl's name. Uh, <laughs> so and then I saw regular Amy Rose was taken, and you know it'll be like, well, Amy take and you want one of these so i just clicked the first one uh and then uh over time i made my first recurring username uh on gaia online and you'll never know what that is because i was like 10 11 years old and it's cringy as hell <laughs> <laughs> uh and nobody will ever well. know what it was and then about two years later, I made another one. And some people know this one. I don't like it very much anymore, but uh, but it was Denix. Uh, at least that's okay. how I pronounced it. I was really into Kingdom Hearts at the time. And you know, what they'll do with the, the nobodies is it'll just be like a, an anagram of their original name plus the letter okay. X. So that's what Denix was. Uh, hmm. And then I got older and I realized so oh, no, Kingdom Hearts is crap. And you know, <laughs> by the time I was, you know, and it, that had been bugging me since I was like 16, 17. But I was like, I felt branded, you know, I was like, I'm yeah. already, I'm already here. Yeah, I, and then, I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, when I was like 20, 21 ish, and I was like, you know, I kind of want to start doing uh, YouTube again. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a, a pretty small channel when I was younger. It was mostly just con vlogs and stuff like that. Okay. Um, okay. But, you know, I got to a point and I was like, you know, I want to try YouTube again. But I was like, okay, but if I'm going to do this, you know, I am absolutely changing my fucking username because, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, not about to, I'm not about to let this bug me for the next, you know, rest of my life. Yeah, branding and, is uh, essential. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not about to have this Kingdom Hearts ass username <laughs> for the rest of my life. Good call. So that was uh that was kinda how I justified changing it. Yeah. I remember my my really first username when I first got online. Like it, it was I remember it was in two thousand and one when I got my first internet connection and my first PC and that wow. life started for me. Uh, and um so yeah I was I was a teenager of course and um it was, uh, I was really into uh, Max Payne. This is a game that was just released and it was awesome. And I still think it's awesome, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, so um, I, I wanted to register on a, on a, some video game message board. And I wanted to, to name myself Max Payne. But of course, I wasn't the first. So uh, for a long while, my uh, online username was Max Payne 4. Oh my god. And that's really a sign of the times it was made in. It was, it's really dated, but... <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I think everybody gets that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that old. But uh, yeah, Max Payne 4 was my, my, my first username when I first started getting online. And after that, it's just a blur. Because I changed so many times and had so many fucking retarded usernames so 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 because so, i i some at some point i remember i uh changed once a month mm. it was like yeah because I, I was getting bored uh, of, of all that so fast and it was i wasn't even a kid at the time it was uh recently when i was on twitter i was like it was like in 2012 mm. that's six years ago when i was in my mid-20s oh wow <laughs> i was like yeah just just changed my fucking username every month 
and uh, and because of that, a lot of people were always asking me, "But who are you? Do I know you? Why, why do I follow you? I don't remember who you are." Oh my god! And it was the like the the worst thing, <laughs> like literally shooting myself in the foot. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember now why uh, the the Morito is coming back uh, to me. Uh, it's um, so the, the leaf of mint. Uh, is meant to represent the the four leaves of the 4chan logo because mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's been a huge influence for me and it's it's where I learned how to internet you know I was spending all my days on 4chan for years uh, about 10 ish years ago mm -hmm. and uh, the glass is a tumbler which is another place that is really dear to my heart where I learned a lot of things about memes and shit posting and um, what else uh, I choose an alcoholic drink uh, because uh, what um, my content is like not for little kids what <laughs> I choose an alcoholic drink to signify that uh, my content is not for little kids but I'm but uh, I'm 10 years old <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean <laughs> you know that's that's kind of stupid, but uh, at the time there was this huge uh, Logan Paul scandal, and I was seeing all his fans who were like ten years old. Are you uh, referring to on, the Suicide on, on, Forest thing? Amongst other things, that and the the, the rest, the whole yeah. Paul Brothers debacle. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, and and I think maybe he's um. Maybe one of the reasons uh, he's like that is because his fans are so young and they, they, he is a bad example for them and they being really young enable this kind of uh, behavior because of course when you're a kid that shit is just hilarious period. And um, and yeah, I was looking at my statistics and uh, the average uh, viewer age for for my the shit that I do online whether it is exploding fish or or this YouTube channel or whatever. Uh, it's uh, around 25 years old. So I was, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an adult channel, not adult as in uh, don't whip my dick out every day, but adult as in, uh, you know, refined and uh, kind of like the playboy of old, you know, where they talk about jazz and uh, all that shit. <laughs> and, <that's, laughs> and I'm not even sure if that's ironic or not. It's a lot of things that I do are half ironic, half serious. So, um, but yeah, and uh, there was there were uh, other reasons, but uh, they don't come back to me right now. Um, of course, one of the reasons is that I wanted to have a shorter name. So I thought, um, for some reason, I thought that six letters would be the ideal. So I was looking for something that was six letters, and uh, yeah, it's pretty symmetrical. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so now I I changed my um my official uh, nickname to Chad Mojito, which is um. A reference to the the fact that um, uh, mojito with that uh, alcohol is a virgin mojito, and so the virgin and Chad meme. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm Chad mojito, and uh, before I was always referring to myself as crocodile death speed, which is always, you know, when you have to put it in a um, in a text box, it's always a few characters too long. Mm. And it was so annoying, this long name. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think I answered your question. Yeah. Um, I don't think I forgot um, anything. But to I want to bounce on something that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, you said that you were a big history buff. And um, I, I always forget about that. But yeah, so I have a question about that. Actually, two questions, but maybe your answer will be the same. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the most interesting uh, time period? And what is the time period where you would want to live the most? Okay. Well, the live thing is kind of a loaded question because since I, uh, since I know how unsanitary a lot of these time periods were, I wouldn't want to live in any of them, but I would like to visit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, what? Well, yeah, yeah. I said live, but you can think of it as a, a holiday. Yeah, yeah, because if, so, you know, I get that question sometimes, like, where would you want to live? And I'm like, 2018, where we have good fucking hygiene. Um, <laughs> sure. 2018, yeah. where I can eat uh, a piece of meat or a vegetable and, uh, you know, generally not have to worry uh, about, you know, getting a disease. <laughs> um, so for most interesting, um, 
I'll, I'll kind of like I'll do this thing where I'll like research one era of history for like ever and then like I'll get tangentially interested in another and so for like for a couple months I'll just like obsess over like that one oh, and then I'll just kind of hop along um I yeah. think the one that I go back to the most is definitely um England in the Middle Ages and the Tudor era uh Honestly, yeah, hmm. I'll probably go with Tudor era England. Um, I think okay. Tudor era England is really fucking cool, and there is no shortage of information you can get on Tudor era England because it was just such a fascinating time for England. There was all this progress being made. The politicians were, well, what's the word? Definitely more memorable than most of the other ones they had seen at that point. Um, and even colorful. Entering- I mean, I guess. Yeah, colorful. And even going into the Tudor era, the War of the Roses, that whole thing, oh my god, that was was quite time for them. So, um, Middle Age England, especially the War of the Roses and through the Tudor era, um, that's probably my most interesting, but right now, the thing I'm reading up on a lot, it's actually a person, and it is Philip the Good. He was, he was the Duke of Burgundy for a while okay. in the middle ages and he was just a really interesting fellow i uh recently bought a book on him i'm not too far into it right now but i really like i really like what i'm reading so far hmm. um i'm also really big on art history so sometimes i'll also like be looking oh. into artists while i do this uh and lately i'm really into fra angelico um because okay. there was an exhibition of his work at the isabella stewart garden museum while i was in boston a couple weeks ago and i missed it and i was really oh, upset fuck. and then i was like oh and then i was like well wait why am i really upset like i don't know all that much about fra angelico and now i'm going back reading about fra angelico and i'm like yeah now i'm really upset that i missed out on this <laughs> exhibition fuck um i get that yeah and as for the one i would want to visit the most Assuming, assuming I have like a safety bubble and I cannot be <laughs> diseased or or fatally wounded. Because <laughs> okay. the fact of the matter is with a lot of the time eras I'm interested in, that's a very real possibility. Okay, so um, imagine that imagine that it's just like at the ending of Earthbound when your soul and mind is put into a robot, you know? Yeah. You visit in this state. Yeah, um, except I don't look like a robot because then I'd probably probably get killed just because i look different you know that's how it was back then (laughs) um ooh, there's a couple i would really want to see happen with my own eyes i mean obviously the first couple things that come to mind are i'd like to visit you know just any frame of history where it's been lost or biased you know heavily and we're not totally sure what happened so that way i can be there to see what happened i'd love to be in the tower of london when the boys in the tower incident happened and that's where two young princes were being kept in the tower by um richard the third um and then they died and nobody's totally sure how historians you know debate about it every day to this very day you know some people say it was richard himself some people say richard hired people to do it for him some people say it was henry the seventh or someone that henry the seventh hired you know you can argue about this all day and i'd love to Hmm. I'd love to see it with my own eyes. Uh, and, you know, a lot of a lot of Middle Age Europe in general history has been lost, and I'd love to see that. I think, I think more than anything, I'd love to um, be there when... Uh, so there's this art piece. It's called the Ghent Altarpiece, and it is widely considered to be one of the most important pieces of art in the world. Uh, but it is also the most stolen piece of art in the world. This thing... Huh. Everything bad that could have happened to a piece of art has happened to the Ghent altarpiece. And uh, the thing with the Ghent altarpiece, if you look at a picture of it, it's actually like, it's, it's an altarpiece. It's a, it's a bunch of windows, sort of a bunch of panels that are, yeah. you know, um, attached together to form an altarpiece. And one of those pieces is actually still missing to this very day. And it's been missing since the 1930s. And oh. I desperately wish to see it returned to oh. its full glory. Um, one of my life goals, one of Can my... You, excuse me? Mm-hmm. Yeah? No, I just wanted to you to, to spell the name. Oh, the Ghent altarpiece? Uh, Ghent is yeah. G-H-E-N-T, and then altarpiece. Oh, the city. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyways, um, and one of my 
unobtainable life goals is to recover the piece that's missing. It's called the Just Judges panel. So I would really like to just sit there in the Cathedral of Bavo, which is uh, which is where its um, home is, uh, the night it got uh, pilfered in the 30s. And I would just like to sit there, you know, just kind of chilling up in the front, you know, waiting for the thief to show up so I can be like, sup, you don't want to do this, buddy. <laughs> That's some Indiana Jones shit. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine you with a with a hat and uh, everything. Yeah. So I guess with my visit, I would like to I'd like to recover some piece of history that's been lost. Um, sure. If that's not what if, about if that's not a possibility, I guess I'll chill. Um, oh no! I guess it's I'll a, chill it's a, in Victorian England. It's a fantasy. England. You make the rules. Then I okay. then I guess I'll chill in Victorian England because that was a okay. It was a really prosperous time for England, and I think it'd be really cool to see it all in action. Um, I would say Tudor England, but if I'm going to be a peasant, like that's it's not a risk I want to take. It's uh, it's it's funny what you just said about the the missing art piece, uh, because uh, in your in your dream fantasy, uh, you stop the thieves. Uh, I would love to do that. Just you just don't. So, uh, do you think that if you could travel history, you would? change some stuff like that like for example uh we were talking about missing things and uh, we don't really know what happened and it made me think a lot about the the library of alexandria yeah. which uh, burned for unknown reasons yeah and uh, we don't we don't even know half of the books that actually were in there but actually um it, it uh, allegedly contained uh, uh, old knowledge in the world and do you think uh, you would like stop uh, the those kind of events from happening Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, you, there's a lot of things. Of the, hmm? Wouldn't you be afraid of the potential consequences? You know, the butterfly effect. I mean, I'm assuming I I have like um, I, I can't think of a better comparison. So I'm sorry if you don't get this reference. Uh, I'm assuming I have like Okabe Rintaro style. Like I I remember what it's like in every timeline powers. Um, so even if I butterfly effect, you know, one, you know string of events i i still remember what it's like before um so that way i have something to compare it to so i can say okay so is this actually the better scenario okay but you know you, i think i think you... anybody would want to stop you know not not just art theft you know but like a lot of worst tragedies we've had in human history i mean i know it's really cliche to say you know i want to go back in time and stop the holocaust but like You know, you find anyone who has that opportunity, like, if that were something that could actually happen, you know, you know, I'd like to find somebody who wouldn't want to go stop the Holocaust. You know, I think that's a pretty normal thing to want. Yeah, and um, if you had to, like, kill Hitler, at what time would you do it? Like, when he's a baby? Or I mean... Just when, just when after he rose to power? Or, you know, before he wrote, he wrote Mein Kampf? I mean, when, I... When, I, would, I when would you do it? I don't know very much about World War II history. A lot of my historical interest really drops after the Enlightenment era, so I actually, I actually don't know all that much about World War II. Um, hmm. But, um... What about Genghis Khan, then? <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> Again, you're you're asking me about someone I, I admittedly don't know much about. Uh, I think I think the better okay. one to say would be Napoleon Bonaparte, which you okay. know at the time he would have been active. You know he he was their Hitler. You know if you lived anywhere, kinda yeah, it, not kinda. He was absolutely. I mean he wasn't as bad as Hitler, obviously, but um, but to people at the time, you know that that was their worst case scenario. If you lived anywhere but hmm. France. You know, or Russia, eventually. You know, especially if you were in Europe, you know, you were just, there was no hope. You know, you just you just kind of had to sit there and be like, well, I guess my country is going to get fucking invaded by the French and our armies are going to die in a massive slaughter. I don't really see what's, I don't really see what's wrong about this, but I may be a little biased. I, I, you know, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe a little just bit. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, well, yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. But yeah, no, dude, Napoleon, for everybody who wasn't French, he was terrifying. You know, the U.S., you know, we were in this really weird position where we, like, didn't have to be directly afraid of him, and that's why mm -hmm. we were able to do the Louisiana Purchase. But yeah. for Europeans at the time, the idea of your country being taken over like that, 
you know, before you really have the time or manpower to do anything, you know, look at any reports of him at the time. You know, people were terrified of Napoleon um, up until up until he eventually got stopped in Russia. And they were like, OK, yeah. so this guy is a little more marshmallowy than we thought. Um, <laughs> but uh. but up until that happened. Yeah. No, dude, Europe was terrified, absolutely petrified of Napoleon. Yeah, we, we don't we don't often think about this because often when people talk about Napoleon, it's only about, you know, military strategy and the battles. And uh, often you think that, well, if you're not a soldier, you wouldn't have to give a shit about this. But it's it's true that he, he actually conquered uh, territories and, and countries and, and all that. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, when, when people talk about him, it's not often uh, mentioned. Yeah, that people were genuinely terrified. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like Bonnie and Clyde. You know, we've kind of romanticized them. Uh, oh yeah, but but people yeah, forget yeah. that you know if you were there at the time and if you were in an area that was you know somewhere that they could affect, like the notion of them showing up was actually really terrifying. Like if you were yeah, living absolutely. in the Midwestern United States, especially if you were working at a bank. Uh, or we're living in an otherwise wealthy area of, you know, Texas, mm. Oklahoma, or Arkansas, you know, the idea of Bonnie and Clyde showing up and shooting, you know, the whole place up was horrifying. You know, there's a reason that the police wanted them so badly, you know? I think people like to simplify things, maybe. Sometimes it's, uh, it's just to tell a better story. Sometimes it's because of propaganda. Sometimes it's... Uh, another reason but yeah yeah the more you read about uh famous figures historical figures of uh of yesterday uh, yesteryear and uh, and all that and uh, the more you you learn like a lot of weird shit about people like uh i know exactly I, I a kind of example that would actually be very fitting for this conversation since you're french like louis the 14th the sun king oh you know he was uh you know he was He's regarded as, you know, one of the uh, best kings who's ever ruled France. But from my understanding, the French opinion is not so much. And that's largely because he was just not all there as a person. Uh, the guy um, had a reputation of kind of being a dick. Um, uh, he was a tyrant. Yeah. Flat, flat out tyrant. Yeah. He put he put a lot of people in jail or torture for just no reason at all. Exactly. And uh, he, he, he gave himself more power through through modifying the constitution and uh, make him, making himself like all powerful. If, even if at the time the kings already were really, really powerful. But uh, yeah, yeah, he was really an... Uh, an absolute, uh, an absolute monarch and an absolute tyrant. Yeah, and to people uh, who don't what... know as much about French history, you know, they'd see like, oh, Louis XIV, you know, he made Versailles. He, uh, you know, he was well, on the yeah. throne for a long I mean, time. You know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, oh, because of that, he must have been a great king. No, no, that's not no. the case at all. You know, if you actually go in there and you read, you know, about the kind of stuff he did, he was, he was a jerk. Yeah, it's it's well known here actually, but yeah, yeah, yeah I would imagine, really, I would imagine it's really well known over there. It's it's less known about Napoleon. A lot of people don't realize what Napoleon was, but Louis the Fourteenth is uh, widely regarded as one of the worst tyrants we ever had. So, how do you and, guys uh, feel about Louis the Sixteenth? Um, it's kind of divided, but mo most of us kind of feel like sorry for him, mm -hmm. like uh, he didn't deserve what happened to him. Uh, mm -hmm. They could have just like they could have just demoted him and put him in a well. They tried to the, they the tried countryside. to demote him actually, and he fled France uh, that... when that happened. That's um, that's around the time the uh, the tennis court accord or whatever it's called was made. But uh, yeah, they did try to demote him, and he was very reluctant about giving up his power because he was of the belief that you know a king power came from god that the king's oh, power was absolute remember. and um you know when people did you know come up and tell him like well hey you know give more power to the people he he did eventually you know sign an act that allowed that but his attitude was very bitter about it and huh. he and his family they did try to flee france at one point because they were going to try and go to, I believe it was Austria, uh, which was, you know, Marie Antoinette's home country. Uh, and they were going to hmm. try to get them on their side so they could, you know, bring some military to France to tell the people, hey, calm your shit. This, this is your king. You know, stop that shit. His power is absolute. But they got caught by revolutionaries. And uh, 
And from there, you know, they got so pissed at him that they demoted him even further. And they were like, you're okay. basically just going to be a figurehead so that other countries don't think something is afoot. Uh, and we're just keeping you alive um, to put up appearances. He was a, he was a very passive guy, you know? Um, yeah, and you wouldn't really yeah. know much of this if you have records from his writings or the writings of people around him that would say, like, you know, he's kind of going along with this, but he's not very happy about it. But, you know, yeah. uh, it's very well known about Louis XVI that he wasn't really an assertive guy. And if he felt a certain way about something, he often wouldn't really go out of his way to assert that. He would just kind of go with the flow. So if he was yeah. being told, you know, hey, you know, do this or we're going to kill you and your family, you know, he wasn't really the type to fight it. Um, I think one of the most well-known things about him uh, here is that he was absolutely, uh, he, he had a, a, a passion about, oh, I forgot the English word. Locksmithing. That. Exactly. Locksmithing and food. Those were Louis the Sixteenth's two great loves and lives. Yep. Uh, not Marie Antoinette, incidentally. Um, <laughs> what is her? Yeah, yeah. He um, he was way more into locksmithing than he ever was politics. And when he wasn't absolutely making locks, yeah. he was enjoying French dining. Um, never really showed much interest in politics. And unfortunately, Marie was, you know, the same way with fashion and gossip and gambling and all that, you know, <laughs> neither of them were particularly interested in politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what happens sometimes. Kind of like, uh, kind of like Zelda in Breath of the Wild. Don't know if you've, if you've played it, but, you know. I love Breath of the Wild. Oh, yeah, me too. Sometimes you just have things thrust upon you and you are kind of helpless. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, what is known to uh, you mentioned um, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, what is uh, well known about him here, especially now that a lot of research confirmed it, is uh, he was so uh, he was such an asshole and was so uh, angry and uh, and mean with everyone uh, because he had um, uh, ass cancer. <laughs> Did he actually? Uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly the medical term, but it's some anal thing. I, I think I think the, I think the medical term is ass cancer. Okay, let's roll with it then. And um, and yeah, and, and he had a, a tumor right on his asshole. So uh, and every time he was just sitting down, it was hurting him. Uh, riding a horse was agony for him. And uh, you know, uh, of course, taking a shit, uh, it was probably a lot of pain too. So uh, that's what made him angry all the time. I mean, that's what is widely believed, uh, at least. And we have records of him uh, making all his doctors train themselves on a thousand uh, peasants uh, before they could operate on him. And uh, so he he lived most of his life with a, you know, uh, I I I don't atomic hemorrhoids. You know, so, something mm. like, not exactly cancer, but um, stronger something. than hemorrhoids. Something really bad uh, in uh, in in his asshole. So. Uh, Damn, I didn't know that. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a fun fact about him. Yeah. Uh, this man was obsessed with perfume. He was so obsessed with perfume that he would bathe in it. Yeah. And uh, he'd use it as um as like a breath spray. Yeah. And you know he was he was very well known womanizer. And it's, uh, you know, writing tell tells us that it was not a rare occurrence for him to not like, you know, some of the ladies he was getting with their, their smell or their breath. And sometimes he would make them bathe in perfume, too, uh, before they could get together or he'd, like, spray their breath with perfume. Huh, that's, I, that, uh... that's, a, that's a fun nugget of information. Do that what yeah. you will. Have fun at Trivia Night. Yeah, I remember, see, I remember reading a book on, uh, on you know, how life was in Versailles and um, apparently uh, a lot of people who visited uh, complained about the smell like everyone was ap apparently shitting in the corners and bathing themselves with perfume to cover the smell and it was like a nightmare for the senses uh, I mean not yeah. all the senses but the, the, the nose, the old faction I mean it certainly like... wasn't a nightmare for the eyes no, it's, it's it looks pretty nice yeah, have you been there? Uh, no uh, I haven't. Uh, maybe one day. And uh, um, you're you're French, and you've never been to Versailles. 
What? How is that even possible? Don't you all just live there? <laughs> I, thought, well, I thought y'all just lived there in the loop. <laughs> I thought you took turns. Some of you no. get to sleep in the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> You're telling me that's not what life in France is about? I'm so disillusioned. Uh, I'm sure sleeping in the Eiffel Tower is possible, though, but uh, it's not very far from uh, where I live. I think it's a one-hour walk. But uh, yeah, Versailles is 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 kind of it's it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and uh, if you go there, there's only the the castle to visit, and I, I heard the visits were not really entertaining. So uh, it's more I I guess for history buffs, which I I am not really. Uh, but um, yeah, apparently uh, there's a fav there's a favorite there's a famous uh, rapper who is from there. And uh, huh. he made a lot. He made a lot of songs uh, about uh, the city, and that's how I uh, I know most uh, of what I know about about it. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, and apparently it's um, it hasn't really changed. Uh, it's very backwards in time, and uh, it's um, it's stuck in the sixties, and uh, all the people are really, uh, you know, religious, which is an oddity here since the country is overwhelmingly uh, atheist, and uh, mm -hmm. they, they all, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, the people who, 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 who uh, do uh, graffiti and and tags, uh, they're uh, they're uh, like uh, uh, pro uh, pro king, uh, the people who want the king to come back and. Uh, that kind of thing, and uh, it's it's really really funny. Imagine a, huh. a city full of uh, Mark Simpsons and Ned Flanders and uh, people like that, you know? Huh? I didn't know that. Apparently, that's how it is. Hmm. It's uh, really really rich, really religious, really white right wing. Uh, it's it's known mostly for that. I didn't know that. Well, now you do. Huh, that's cool. <laughs> And uh, but yeah, I, I could go there. It's um, I don't know, one hour train trip from Paris. It's uh, no, on, in the southwest. Huh. And, uh, maybe maybe I'll go one day. I heard that the um, you know that Chinese thing that do the pretty colors in the sky and the loud noises. That's not fireworks. Da yeah, fireworks. That the that's the word. Uh, okay. So I oh, uh, so they have a, a fireworks show there every year, and I heard it, it was like the best one in the country so i really love fireworks it's one of my favorite things so maybe i'll I'll go there one day just for the fireworks and maybe while i'm there i'll take a peek at the castle oh you should <laughs> yeah that, that that if you if you came here that's what you would uh visit first i guess no 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 i would i would spend pretty much all my time at the Louvre. oh I, I have so many pieces of art that I am dying to see in person. Art history is what got me um, largely interested in history in the first place. Um, and mm -hmm. I consider myself equally as interested in art history as I am regular history. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the pieces I am most interested in seeing in real life can be found in the Louvre. Uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? You are. Oh, cool. Um I guess that year and a half of French I took in high school paid off. Um, uh, in any case, a lot of the pieces that I want to see with my own eyes can be found there. And from what I've heard, it's enormous and you cannot see the whole thing in just one day. You need That's at the least. Truth. Yeah. And I've been told that depending on the speed at which you go, you need anywhere from two to four days to see everything. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, I would say that the four days figure is more realistic than the two days. If you rush it, you can maybe see everything in, in two days. But if you want to take your time and really see everything, uh, four days seems much more realistic. Yeah, and I am 100% the kind of person who I, you know, I, I consider myself quite the museum junkie. So, like, I'm I'm that guy. I will, you know, I read the plate, I study you know, whatever it is in the picture, if it's something that I'm familiar with and I have a lot of knowledge with, I'll look at it a lot closer. You know, I, I am that guy who sits on the bench, you know, in front of the picture and I'll just sit there staring at it for yeah. a long ass time. I, I am that guy. And there's a lot of pieces I feel like I would do that with in the loofah. Uh, so that that's probably what I would do. 
that's what I would spend all my time doing. I was just going to bounce on that and ask you what is your favorite era of art history or your favorite you know, mo movement or, you know? I, I don't really have a set favorite. I'm a big fan of the, it is, this is really cliche, but I'm a big fan of the Italian and the Renaissance. Um, okay. But, I mean, there's quite a couple of post-impressionist pieces I really like. Um, hmm. I mean, you know, going into art history, you know, around now, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we're so aware of so many different artists and their styles um, and the nuances between them. Uh, yeah. Much more, we're, we're so much more hyper aware of it now than we've been that, you know, a lot of people I encounter who I talk art history with, you know, they'll tell me that they, um, you know, there are definitely eras they like best. Yeah. Uh, and then they can just like pluck out different artists, you know, from uh, across, you know, all history. They also really like, though, that, you know, may also incorporate some of those elements into their art or not, and that's why they like them so much, and that's kind of how I feel about it, too. There's, um, you know, I, I do like the Italian and the Northern Renaissance best, but, you know, that's not to say I don't feel negatively toward, you know, say, again, post-impressionism. Um, I mean, some of yeah. my favorite artists are, um, you know, I have, a, I have a holy trinity. Yeah. I have a holy trinity of favorite artists. Uh-huh. And it's and it's Raphael. Yeah. It's Alphonse Mucha. Okay. And it's Ilya Repin. And none of these three painters are very alike. Uh, True. They do not paint in the same style. Yeah. But, um, you know. I also I also really like Gustav Klimt. I'm getting a lot more appreciation for his work. You know, I've always you know everybody likes his golden era stuff because his yeah. golden era stuff is you know very gorgeous. But uh, yeah. But I actually recently saw an exhibition about some of his sketches and some of his work before uh -huh. his golden age. And uh, and ever since seeing that, I have uh, I've found a much more realized, uh, a much bigger appreciation for him because um, you know he did have a, an eye for style and an eye for color certainly, but um, but this guy was a lot more aware of the inner workings of art and anatomy and sketching than a lot of people think he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of time uh, with the artists, you know. Uh, what is famous about their work is only representative of only about like 15 to 20 percent of what they've done in in their body of work and the, they've done a lot of oh, different yeah. stuff and uh and one thing specifically stuck and the the rest has gone kind of forgotten but as they themselves didn't go forgotten then the the stuff re-emerges later and i've discovered a lot of cool cool shit like that uh lately you know that is that is exactly how Vermeer became so famous. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so Vermeer, uh, during his lifetime, he was not a particularly famous painter. And because of that, he painted a very uh, a very small body of work. There uh -huh. were only 36 paintings by him oh. that we had named. Uh, as a matter of fact, I forget his name, but there was one guy who dedicated like the whole second half of his life just to tracking down Vermeer's because he loved them nice. so much. And this was a couple centuries after Vermeer lived. Mm -hmm. And during World War II, again, I forget his name, and I'm sorry, but there was a guy who was actually, he became pretty infamous. He uh, he sold what he claimed were Vermeer's, but uh, they were actually forgeries made by him, huh. uh, made in an identical style to Vermeer's. And, you know, historians and art historians will look at you and say, oh, well, this explains, you know, how yeah. he found out about this technique or how he found this color and all this stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's because of the size of his body of work. You know, um, a couple of his paintings got famous. Um, and then he as an artist got famous. It kind of worked in the opposite way because he did, he did actually have a pretty small body of work. Uh, there were only 36 paintings we had named by him and there's only 35 we know the whereabouts of because one of them yeah, was stolen really in the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist of uh, 19, I believe it was 90 or 91, something like that, the early 90s. Um, huh. But yeah, it's because of his small body of work um, and his high quality that he became famous. And, That's you know, crazy. we look at his work and we... You know, a lot of people associate him with uh, the girl with the pearl earring. You know, obviously, that's like the one thing that, you know, if you know any Vermeers, whether you know his name or not, everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. But like, if you ever can look at pictures, I mean, obviously, if you can see these in person, do that too. Look at pictures of some of his other slightly less 
lesser known works maybe the better word is non-mainstream works yeah like uh, my favorite is the astronomer uh the girl at the writing desk is probably his next most famous one you know if you look at pieces like that you know you will instantly see why you know people fell in love with his work so much when they did you know enough for you know one guy to dedicate his like half of his life to finding them and another guy dedicated his life to forger forging them um you know the girl with the pearl earring is lovely and you know i really i yeah. really wish that we obsessed over vermeer the same way that people in the uh 17 and 1800s did when they first discovered him uh, about 200 years after his death in france his most famous painting is the milkmaid uh because it's oh, okay. uh, it, it was used uh, a lot in ad- in uh, the advertisement for a very big dairy company oh and so i didn't uh, know that And so, uh, yeah, I, I, it's I knew the, the milkmaid was one of his more well-known works, but I didn't know it was used as a popular ad. Yeah, huh. he, here it is. It's like it's it's basically the logo of the company at this point. I, I and the the oh, name wow. the, the name is completely evading me right now. But it's like they make a lot of like yogurts and and, and cream stuff, and you know, it's it must be a bit hard being um, an art history nerd in in the states because. Uh, if I understood correctly, it's one of the subjects that uh, that is really not taught, and and it's um, I don't know if if uh, if I, I hope I'm not being like pedantic or anything, but it, it's it's I got reminded kind of violently of that a, f- a, f- a couple of weeks ago when I was like hanging out on Tumblr looking for the the latest memes and shit, and I was um, I, st- I stumbled upon a post. Of uh, of someone who who said like oh, wow did you know that uh, Picasso died in 1973 uh, maybe uh, uh, at some point he watched the Looney Tunes on TV and uh, and he thought well maybe uh, that's some cool shit maybe I I, I could paint a woman with uh, an eye on her neck and uh, so th- that's a funny thought but all the comments were like what uh, Picasso was alive in the 70s I thought he was a guy from the Renaissance. I thought it was in the what Middle the Ages, hell? and there was uh, like a pile of comments like that, like, what, my whole life is a lie, Picasso is contemporary, what the fuck, oh, that's so yeah. recent, I cannot believe it, and it's, it was like a, a chain of comments like that, like everyone getting their mind bl- minds blown, and I was like, what the fuck, really? Like, I can I can understand for a really obscure painter or whatever, but fuck fucking Picasso? You thought he was from the Middle Ages? What the, what the fuck oh am I God. reading? Oh my God, if Picasso, if Picasso tried to paint any of his cubist stuff in the Middle Ages, fuck he would yeah. have got laughed at. He would have got, he would have got ousted. You know, before he was a cubist painter, he was very good at the more traditional, yep. realistic style of art. Uh, yeah, and he actually, he actually, he uh, actually got into cubism uh because he got so bored with it and he was looking at artists like matisse who yeah. were uh, really pushing the boundaries with fauvism and uh and his take on that turned into cubism now i'd love to talk to these people who didn't know that uh 70s and i'd love to tell them that uh salvador dali died uh yeah. in the late 80s like 88 89 yep. if i recall correctly and um, salvador yep. dali has not been off of this earth for terribly long as a matter of fact he collaborated with walt disney yeah i know yeah yeah that's yeah. uh that's that's crazy i i, I um <laughs> this that's some crazy shit i have photos of him at the beach with my great grandfather and uh oh wow he, yeah it's uh it's it, it's really recent and I'm, i think that if picasso came out uh with this shit in the middle ages maybe he, w- he would have been burned at the fucking stake not just mocked or ridiculed but uh i, I mean don't I, he, some... i don't think he would have been burned at the stake necessarily but i do think i do think there would have been a lot of harsh ridicule for him and he certainly would not have uh, gone anywhere as an artist because uh You know, part of the reason, you know, things like um, postmodern art, you know, things like fauvism, things like cubism were able to take off, you know, was the uh, was the concept of degenerate art was, um, oh, what's what's it called? Um, no, there's a word for it, and it's a French word, no less. Dada! That's it, Dadaism, you know? Yeah. It was, a lot of it goes back to the concept of Dadaism, that if the artist calls it art... Yeah. then it's art and you know certainly the concept of dadaism and you know other things that followed it like fauvism like cubism you know they've always had their, their criticisms you know their critics but you know part of the reason that they were still able to go anywhere despite that you know part of the reason you know we still consider it you know 
so cool today is um is because you know kind of going back to picasso you know artists you know they needed something more than the traditional style you know artists do get bored of drawing in the same style their whole lives so you know after centuries you know art is going to evolve and that was just the next step of evolution you know if this kind of stuff had come out you know before you know society really became bored of it like the middle ages when we were still you know in many ways finding our sea legs for it yep you know it just um but you know if you know it 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 had no place there you know i really do believe that casso if he was painting in his cubist style back when say henry the eighth was on the throne you know, yeah. uh, a big purpose, you know, something else people forget is that art did actually serve a purpose back then, and that was to tell you what other people looked like or to communicate stories. And yeah. Picasso's, yeah. you know, it's stylish, but it doesn't literally communicate, you know, what people look like or literally communicate a story, which is what a lot of paintings back then, you know, that was yeah, you know, yeah, 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 the yeah. fundamental point for a lot of paintings. So, you know, people would have looked at it, they wouldn't have got it. Um yeah, absolutely. Art, art just, for the uh, sake of art. It, a lot of people don't realize that, but art for the sake of art is a relatively recent uh, idea. Uh, uh, I remember um, uh, her hearing about this, um, about like uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, the, the one of the most famous composers of all, all time, who's uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the Baroque era, and mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he didn't he didn't have a a body of work technically because at the time the idea of body of work didn't even exist a lot of things basically everything that he wrote was a commissions for a, a party or a, you know for the king's wedding or whatever or a, people asked him could you write uh, could you write me a piece well it was just it was all commissions or uh, exercises that he wrote for his pupils and uh, yeah. not a single one of the, the hundreds of, of things we we still listen today a lot from uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was uh, intentionally written to be like listened to several times. Most of these was was like one shot pieces that were meant to be played once and then you know that's it. And uh, none of them were, were meant to uh, to propel him to posterity because that just was not a thing at the time. It kind of started in the 18th century where people started to think oh yeah maybe I, I, but yeah it's really recent idea just art for the sake of it mm. it's it's kind of new yeah fairly i mean um i kind of associate it with style or like the concept of stylization because you know there were painters you know even back as far as on to a large part of their body of work was commission or you know um a lot of the more well-known ones were uh, employed by aristocrats or yeah. you know sometimes even by the king himself but you know they did um you know some of them did do paintings just for fun uh well i shouldn't say for fun or i mean maybe i should but uh or, you know, or for you know maybe for fun or maybe for practice but uh yeah probably more so for practice but um but the majority of their body of work was all commission based i uh i kind of associate with the uh the idea of art for the sake of art with the concept of uh stylization because that was when art became less about I'm doing this to record what this looked like. Yeah. Um, maybe with a tinge of style, you know, um, like artists like Rembrandt or Caravaggio, who did have distinct styles. Um, but it went from, you know, a tinge of style to it's becoming less about the literal interpretation, like the literal what this piece looks like, and more the... Um, more of a an impression of it and that's where we get the phrase you know impressionism and post-impression absolutely like yeah that. you know older artists did certainly have their own style but they were less um i don't want to say distinct but um but at the end of the day they were still very much yeah, they were trying like, to literal literal interpretation what they were around it and it was kind of like photography you know or more or, you know, it's uh, about yeah. telling what's happening around you and how the world is and not about, you know, expressing an emotion or whatever. And uh, maybe yeah. maybe the, the maybe the most uh, crazy that seems almost anachronistic of them all is uh, Bosch. Because when you look at the shit he, he did, all that, all the, all those crazy paintings. It's it's kind of almost jarring, no? Don't you think, compared to uh, what existed at the time? Because it was kind of a, 
what um wh when did he um operate it was at the end of the um, it was not even the renaissance yet it was at the the end of the middle ages no uh who's the artist again i'm sorry bosch bosch b-o-s-c-h yep um i'm not completely sure because that's some actually. that that is some crazy shit in it and it's much older than it, most people think it is yeah Let me look it up. I'm actually not entirely sure at the top of my head the years he was active. No, not the TV show. <laughs> I'm getting the power tools and I'm trying to Google it as well. 1500s. Yeah, so, so during the Middle Ages. Yeah, not 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 really the Renaissance yet. No, the Renaissance. Well, uh, it's uh, kind well of... no, he was he was in the Netherlands, so he would have been Northern Renaissance. Yeah. So this this would have been just before. Uh, kind, this of would on, have been just kind of on before. the cusp, yeah. Yeah, this would have been like on the cusp of the Northern Renaissance. But since since he started, you know, earlier than that. Uh... Yeah, that's just when he died. I mean. Yeah, he was born in 1450, so. Uh... Yeah, so that is definitely before the Northern Renaissance. Yep, definitely before, and uh, yeah, the the, the 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 probably his most famous thing is the the Garden of Earthly Delights. You know that crazy shit mm -hmm. in three three panels. And uh, of yeah. course, you could say it's religious work. It's meant to uh, to show like the the heaven, the earth, and hell. But that's I don't know. Compared to what existed at the time, it's kind of not really a black ship thing. But uh, and the guy was, if I remember correctly, super religious. Like he was basically a monk. And all his paintings I mean, he did inside a most, inside most people church. were super religious that time. Yeah, but it's especially surprising, I think, when you look at all the all the things he he painted. Like I don't even, if I remember correctly, he spent all his life in a in a parish, and he never left it ever. And all these paintings were like straight from his head, and maybe from the books he read or whatever. But you know, that's mm. I don't know. He, he always struck me as a, as a real oddity. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding the context or whatever. I don't know. I admittedly, I don't know too terribly much about Bosch. Okay. I wish I could have a, a very founded opinion on that. But <laughs> it's fine. It's I'm it's not, not it's better enough. it's better to say yeah I don't know so I don't have an opinion than to have an opinion on something that you don't really know. I, I hate people who do that. So uh, it's fine. And uh, but maybe I remember what you said earlier about about um, Picasso that w didn't wouldn't have worked. In the Middle Ages, because a society wasn't bored of, you know, uh, art and style as it was at the time, but maybe he wouldn't even have existed at the time because if society w wasn't bored at the time, he wouldn't have been bored either. I think a lot of people are products of the society they they live in, they were raised in, and um, some people. You know, that's that's very true. And it's it's sometimes it's kind of weird. Like, uh, what if uh, this? What if uh, Thomas Edison was born uh, in a cave? Uh, would he have, would he have invented shit? It's like, yeah, maybe. Well, he okay. wouldn't have because then he wouldn't have had Nikola Tesla to invent it for him. <laughs> well, I am very. I am a very Tesla fan. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. So if Thomas Edison was born in a cave away from Tesla, he wouldn't have invented anything because he didn't invent it. <laughs> hey, maybe there was a, a feud even at the time, like, I don't know. Cro oh, there was a huge feud. Tesla Tesla and Edison fucking hated each other. No, no, uh, I, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I meant at the time of the, the cavemen, maybe there were similar feuds. That, well, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe there were. I don't know. I don't know very much about... Um... But yeah, the, there was a there, prehistoric. There was a huge uh, feud between them, and and Edison was really an asshole. Really, it's it's not even about Tesla being a great guy than it is about Edison being the worst asshole in the world and doing all kinds of nasty shit like electrocuting animals to show that electricity was dangerous and uh, you know all that all that all that shit that he did. And your, of course, your audio, your audio is cutting horribly. I couldn't hear a word of that. Oh, can you hear me well now? It, it's still skipping a little bit, but this—I huh. think this is more so a problem with my. 
Discord, my computer and Discord don't get a well, get oh. well, uh, d they don't get along very well together, and since we've been on file, it's probably starting to say, like, oh no, Discord? <laughs> yeah, but maybe if you want, we can uh, end it there. We've been uh, talking for two hours and a half now, I think. Yeah, that's, so, th this is probably a good stopping that's point probably before, more than before enough. my computer totally shits itself. <laughs> Okay, so um, that was really great. Uh, I loved having you uh, in here. This is uh, going to be a, a Thank you really, for having me. really nice first episode of the podcast. And uh, maybe uh, sometime in the future, I'll, I'll have you on again. I don't know. I'd love to be back. Great. Then uh... we can we can uh, we can have our about oh. why Tesla is a fuck that why Edison yeah. is a fucking jerk and why Tesla is one of the most underrated men on the planet. Absolutely, I, I would love that. Alright. Well, um, I was going to say good evening, but I, I have no idea what time is it, where you are. So It's like 3.30pm. Yeah, so good evening is almost appropriate. Almost. Where, what time <laughs> is it over there? Uh, it's uh, 10 and a half pm Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. So you're, about, so you're about, um, about seven hours ahead. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Anyway, uh, well, that you were a great guest. Thanks for all these Thank uh, great conversations. And uh, I don't, I don't know uh, how much time it's gonna take me to edit, but uh, it should probably be on my YouTube channel on uh, Wednesday. I don't know if I'm gonna put that on SoundCloud or I, it's not exactly uh, decided yet. But um, yeah, probably in, in two or three days, it's gonna be on my YouTube channel. So. Um, awesome that's it <laughs> i don't know how to end things i'm really bad at it so uh um, thanks everyone for listening and uh thank you for being an awesome guest and oh, thank uh, you for having me see y'all really soon bye 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 and i guess you can just cut it there yeah that's what i'm gonna do <laughs>